As many of you know, I got married back in June of this year, and we decided that we wanted to take our honeymoon in Scotland and London. We were a bit limited on time, with only about a week to spend there, but we were thrilled to go. We really had very little planned, just our flights, hotels, and a, a few touristy things that were planned ahead of schedule. With our flights and our lodging actually booked on a few years worth of saved up points. Everything else beyond those items really just happened as we wandered around and discovered things that we felt like doing. That being said, our framework was roughly three and a half days each in Edinburgh and London. This, like my trip to Belgium, was really not planned as a specific beer trip. Uh, but there really is a great deal of brewing history and significance in both cities we wanted to visit. And to boot, it's not very hard to find great beer and great pubs in either place. So with that in mind, I just wanted to share our experience really with this video and to show off some of the cool sites that we saw. But also I wanted to use this video to kind of share some unique experiences related to English and Scottish beer culture. Things like Cascale, pub culture, and some of the very unique beers that they have out there. So without further ado, join me on our trip across the pond. Our travel day was a Monday. We actually caught a red eye out of Logan that night and arrived in Heathrow about 9 a.m. local time. From there, we took the underground for about an hour into the center of London. Finding ourselves fairly jet lagged and feeling hungry after being awake for so long, we got off the underground early somewhere around Piccadilly Circus and we wandered around that neighborhood, found ourselves in Soho and then eventually found this Fuller's Pub to get something to eat and drink. While it was recommended that I avoid Tide Pubs, which is where a franchise like Fuller's owns the pub and dictates what kind of beer is served there, I couldn't really argue with meat pies and cold beer at the time. Yes, the beer was actually cold except for the London Pride. It wasn't near freezing, but it also wasn't room temperature either. While these were the first beers of the trip, they weren't really my favorite overall. But the thing is, the notion that British beer is always served warm and flat is just not true. Cask ales are definitely a bit warmer than standard draft beer, but they're not room temp by any means. Most of the beer that we drank during the trip, even cask ales, were actually sufficiently cold to be very refreshing in the summer. As soon as our cravings had been satisfied, we continued on to King's Cross Station and caught a train north to Edinburgh. My experience with the rail network in the UK was outstanding. It was just so easy to walk up and buy a ticket to a train that would actually leave on time and would arrive at a station within walking distance of anywhere you needed to go. That is before the rail strikes happened the day we were leaving, but more on that later. That being said, we didn't really need to rent a car at all the entire time we were there. Between the local rail and the underground, we were really able to get everywhere we needed to go with ease. The train ride from London to Edinburgh was beautiful, and it took about five hours going up the eastern coast of the island. We passed by old castles, beautiful coastal villages, and tons of farmland before finally arriving in Edinburgh. Finally, we made it to our lodging in Leith. We dropped our bags off there and headed out to go grab some late night dinner at a fantastic Greek restaurant. After dinner, my wife was pretty exhausted after a full day of travel, so she headed back, but I decided to soldier on and go check out the local pub, Robbie's. This was my first experience with real cask ale served from a beer engine, and I'd been awake for about 36 hours, so I was really excited for this experience, and it certainly was a great one. Cask ale is a quintessential part of beer culture in the British Isles, and it fundamentally changes the way a beer is perceived. Instead of being pushed out of the keg with carbon dioxide or nitrogen or a mix, cask ale is instead pulled out of a firkin, which is essentially a steel barrel, using a vacuum created by a hand-pumped beer engine. As the cask is emptied, it is exposed to gradually more and more oxygen, which necessitates the need for drinking a cask quickly, typically within about 48 hours of being tapped. This also, however, guarantees that the beer you're drinking is exceptionally fresh. The beer in the cask is naturally carbonated to a low level, and when the beer engine releases the liquid in the serving glass, it actually infuses air into the beer, creating a really rich, thick, creamy head and a really long-lasting cascade of bubbles in the beer, which is exceptionally pleasing to watch. In addition, this gives the beer a smooth and velvety mouthfeel and a very, very high drinkability. It's a hard thing to really describe it and put it into words, just how significant of an impact this has on a standard beer, but it absolutely elevates the experience. However, I learned there's also certainly a range of quality in cask ales, and some are certainly better than others. And it all comes down to the execution. So this is where it pays off to go to the local spots that are off the beaten path and to avoid the touristy areas and the Tide pubs that are serving only one brand of beer you've probably heard about in the US. If cask ale isn't your thing, don't be afraid, don't be concerned, because there's still plenty else to order. 
Typically, if you want a beer and you ask what's available, the bartender might ask you if you want an ale, a lager, or a cider. Lagers and ciders are just as common as cask ales, if not more so. And of course, there's plenty of Guinness to go around as well. Something else I found really interesting is that most of the time, if a beer isn't on cask, it will typically be poured with a stout spout from a nitro or a beer gas line instead of with CO2, like it is in the United States, out of a regular through and through tap. This imitates the cascading effect you get with a cask ale served off a beer engine, but it really can't come close to the real thing. The next morning we fought off all of our jet lag, got up and explored the city. Edinburgh is a very fun city and it's extremely walkable. Where we stayed in Leith, every single building has a different restaurant or pub on the first floor by the street for a continuous mile at least. There is food from no joke every corner of the globe and plenty of fun and exciting things to do. If you go to Edinburgh, I definitely recommend checking out Leith Walk, Edinburgh Castle, Calton Hill, Arthur's Seat, if you're up for a serious climb, and the Royal Mile for getting the most out of a single day in the city. That morning, we unintentionally participated in a bit of a tourist trap, but after that, we climbed up Calton Hill for amazing views of the city and the nearby mountains, and then we headed down to start what we didn't realize at the time would become a very fun, but very long day of drinking. We stopped by a hotel bar for an appealingly priced drum of Glenfiddich 21, and then we headed to our last planned destination for the day, Holyrood Distillery. This is a relatively new distillery, and it's the first distillery in Edinburgh for about a hundred years. This distillery was on my list because it has very strong ties to Edinburgh's historical brewing culture. The city used to be known for its beers, like most famous brewing cities, because of its unique water profile. It was here that many well-known Scottish ales were made, but oddly enough, there was really no whiskey footprint in the city. Holyrood Distillery is only about three years old, but it is well on its way to becoming an established name. Since most of their true Scotch whiskey is still in barrels, since it needs to be barrel-aged for a certain period of time to be considered Scotch, we were unable to taste that barrel-aged version. But we were lucky to have several different and interesting examples of new make, or white whiskey, that has not been in a barrel yet. They also have a very solid gin program there. Hollyrood employs many former beer brewers who are treating the whiskey program very similarly to making beer, experimenting with different yeasts and malts that will sound very familiar to beer brewers. Whiskey distillation and beer brewing are in fact very similar up to a point. All whiskey actually starts its life off as a regular unhopped and usually unboiled beer, optimized for the extraction of sugars and maximizing fermentability and alcohol production. However, once the distillation begins, most of the flavors from yeast, grain, and other ingredients, as well as color, begin to disappear. Even traditional off flavors in beer brewing will distill out. You could make the world's worst beer, distill it, and have a high quality new make. That being said, there are some characteristics that stick around. Subtleties in the flavor and the mouthfeel of the whiskey that come from different ingredients that Holyrood is experimenting with, such as kvike or sake yeasts, chocolate malt, golden promise, or various types of crystal malts and smoke malts. And it's very cool to see a distillery not only experimenting with these ingredients that are typically meant for a beer, but also to see them proudly putting it on their labels. Long after our fantastic tour ended, I spent a long time talking with the tour guide, Owen, and discussing some of the experiments they tried out, things that worked and things that didn't. By the end of this tour, we were about six drinks deep, and Owen gave us a special souvenir, some malts from Holyrood that will eventually end up in a special Scottish ale sometime soon. From Holyrood, we headed down to a highly recommended beer bar and bottle shop, The Salt Horse. It was a great establishment, and it was here that I tasted some of the craftiest beers I had the entire trip. I also indulged in a guilty, but not so guilty, Budvar. When in Europe. Come on, it was a side pull. Before we knew it, it was late at night, so we went out for some dinner at a fantastic spot along the Royal Mile, Gordon's Trattoria. We spent a very long time trying to figure out which person Gordon was because we were a bit drunk at the time, um, but the staff put up with us and uh, after explaining that we were on our honeymoon and just having a great day, we actually got sent on our way with three or four limoncello shots that were all on the house. Uh, great place, great people. Highly recommended restaurant, and I am going to call them out by name because they were just so awesome. From here, we decided that it was time to do a pub crawl. It all starts to kind of blend together at this point, but we traveled to three or four different pubs that evening, walking all over the city before stumbling back to our room and crashing hard. 
All in all, it was a solid first full day in Scotland. While we're on the topic, there's a few things that Americans should know before checking out the pubs in either England or Scotland. First, there's two different kinds of establishments that appear very similar, ale houses and pubs. Ale houses are warm, inviting places to have a social drink, or many, but you won't find any food served there. You'll have to head to a pub in order to actually find food in addition to your drinks. Secondly, in either establishment, you'll want to place your orders for food and drinks at the bar. And you want to pay at the bar in most cases as well. It is extremely rare for a bartender to come to your table to ask you what you want, but it sometimes happens when you're obviously American. It's also not normal for a place to leave a tab open for you either, so just pay as you go in most cases. Thirdly, pub culture is a difficult thing to describe, but it is now one of my favorite ways to enjoy a drink. You are welcome to be as social or antisocial as you want to be. It's totally normal to see a bunch of folks drinking by themselves at their own tables or at the bar, or to see large groups of people out together watching a game, for example. In the UK, there is no element of drinking culture that shames you for being on your own or for drinking at noon either. It's also relatively easy to strike up a conversation with the locals or the bartenders if you feel out of place. Just be sure you have a drink in your hand first. Most locals we talked to were a bit cold and standoffish at first, but after about five minutes of spending time drinking near them, they started opening up and in every case we found them to be wonderful people who were a ton of fun to drink with. The following day, we decided to take a random train trip north. We ended up in Inverness, but actually stopped for the afternoon in Perth. Perth is a fun little town that's definitely worth spending a few hours in, but after this, we continued on north to Inverness. And this was easily the most beautiful train ride of the entire trip, going through the heart of the highlands and passing by some amazing sights. Inverness was a gorgeous place, and a lot smaller than I thought it would be. It looks like a great place to spend a day eating and drinking through the city. And I wish we had a little bit more time, but we did have to get out of our hotel rather early the next day and head back south to London. That morning we caught an early train out to Edinburgh, but somehow picked the most crowded train possible. And an extremely obnoxious bachelorette party forced us to get off the train on the first stop south of Inverness, which happened to be this really charming town called Aviemore. Aviemore was one of my favorite locations of the entire trip and we never would have stopped here if we didn't decide to ditch the train. It feels like a Colorado ski town nestled up in the highlands at the base of the Cairngorms, and it was here that we discovered a really, really wonderful brewery, Cairngorm Brewing. We spent several hours here chatting with the host Malky, drinking their fantastic beer, and befriending some Australians who were also on vacation. Cairngorm Brewing had some of the best beer of the entire trip and definitely inspired us to take a bunch of bottles home with us, one of which I'm drinking right now. We headed to their pub, The Winking Owl, for some food and some more beer before heading back to Edinburgh. And it was here that I finally tried haggis. It's really not bad at all. It's kind of like a greasy, savory meatloaf. Uh, and I would indeed have it again. The train back to Edinburgh also passes right past the Dalwini Distillery in the Highlands, and it has its own station. The plan was to hit up Dalwini on the way back to Edinburgh, but unfortunately our specific train did not stop there on its current schedule. So this legendary spot is just gonna have to wait for another time. Finally making it back to Edinburgh, we grabbed some phenomenal Indian food for dinner and enjoyed a 10.30 p.m. sunset before getting ready to head back to London. The next day, we took our train back to London and checked into the next hotel for the afternoon. We took it fairly easy that day, but ended up walking several miles in the evening trying to find places to eat that were open. We accidentally wandered into the Belgravia neighborhood looking for food. Turns out this is where all the embassies are and uh, none of the restaurants. Nevertheless, we eventually found this really great pub called the Star Tavern and spent several hours there drinking 3.5% cask ales and chatting with locals before getting food at the end of the night. Totally worth the walk. A first time visitor to the UK may be curious why most beers you will find are in the 3-5% range and rarely over that. And the answer is twofold. Tradition and taxes. The tradition exists partially because during both world wars, everything was so heavily rationed that it became very normal to drink near beer and weaker beverages as there was just simply less to go around. But the main driver of tradition is that most locals just enjoy going to the pub or the ale house and having several pints with friends on any given evening. The social aspect of drinking is far more valued than the effect of alcohol. And when people down something like three to six pints on a Tuesday session, they don't usually find themselves wanting to be in a drunken state at the end of that. 
Add to that, there is also the social norm of trading around buying the next round for your group, and you usually don't want to be the only one who didn't buy a round at the end of the night. However, it really is the tax on the alcohol that makes a big difference. In addition to the base cost of the beer you're buying, a tax is levied per percent ABV and is bracketed in different groups. So for example, a pint of 3% beer would be taxed at a rate of 19 pence per percent ABV per liter. So that 19 pence is applied three times for 3% over one liter. This makes a pint of a 3% beer taxed to about 25 pence. But a pint of 8% beer, on the other hand, is taxed at a rate of 25 pence per percent per liter. So that tax on about a full extra pound to a pint. Interestingly, this tax also varies depending on whether it's beer, cider, wine, or spirits. Add to this, there's also a 20% value-added tax on all alcohol purchases across the board, and it can get very expensive to drink high ABV beers very quickly. So most people tend to stick to the lower ABV stuff. Nevertheless, you'll find that the cost of a pint will vary significantly from region to region. In London, a 4% Cascale was around 7 to 8 pounds a pint, while up in Scotland, most of the time I was drinking from less than 2 pounds to 4 pounds per Cascale, even in Edinburgh. Regardless, in my opinion, it is still worth it to go pay the extra cash to spend time drinking great beer in a pub, even if just for the environment, regardless of the strength of the beer. The next morning, we planned to check out some local sports and headed to a rugby game. We passed by the quintessential London sites, Big Ben, Parliament, and the London Eye, before grabbing a train out to Twickenham to watch the game. It was a solid game that was a ton of fun to watch, but I highly recommend you actually understand how the rules of rugby works, instead of just going to the game and trying to figure it out on the fly. But huge cups of Guinness helped convince me that I knew what was going on. After the game, we made our way to a great German beer garden next to the river in Richmond, before finally heading back into the city via the underground that night. The next day was our last full day in London, and we decided that since we were in the Tower Hill neighborhood, we should check out the Tower of London before heading across Tower Bridge to the Bermondsey Beer Mile, a mile-long stretch of London's finest craft breweries. Turns out one can easily spend a whole day at the Tower of London, exploring its old passageways and storied history. Following a very full day at the tower, we walked across Tower Bridge in hopes of checking out the Bermondsey Beer Mile, but apparently none of the breweries were open on Mondays and we didn't even think to check on this beforehand, so unfortunately I missed out on a highly recommended London Beer Classic. There is always next time though, and I fully intend on returning. Still, we made the most of our jaunt into Bermondsey by spending the rest of the evening at the Woolpack, which was an awesome pub and outdoor beer garden that served some excellent food and beer. Heading back, we enjoyed some really great lighting off of Tower Bridge and ended the day with a good beer from Karen Gorm Brewing. The final morning was a pretty hectic one, since it was the beginning of the worst rail strike in about a century and we had to somehow get to the airport in the middle of all that. All of the cabbies were all booked, and it took over half an hour to get an Uber, and this was probably the most expensive Uber I've ever booked in my life. But it did get us a nice drive by of Buckingham Palace, and we got to the airport. So shortly after that historic event, we were on the plane and on our way back to Boston. Despite the final day's chaos, it was a great honeymoon and a wonderful way to explore new areas with my wife and make some great memories with her. But it also being my first time in the UK, I learned and experienced a ton of things in a beer culture that you just don't get in the United States. You really do have to go experience it firsthand to understand and appreciate why it is the way it is. Upon arriving back home and heading to our local brewery, it really stood in stark contrast to how different American beer is and how different our drinking culture is as well. Regardless, I cannot wait to get back and do more exploration. There is so much more I have yet to see and experience in a great craft brewing scene that I didn't tap into very deeply this time, so I really do hope to come back soon. And to my English and Scottish viewers, thank you so much for all the recommendations and the advice. The next round is on me. Cheers.